So our speaker tonight is Dr. Nick Walden, Walden um, who is a plasma physicist at the United Kingdom Atomic Energy Authority. Uh, if you haven't heard of it, it's a uh, research institute based in Cullum, which is just south of Oxford. Um, and it's one of the world's uh, leading fusion energy research labs. The experiment uh, Nick works on in particular is called the MAST experiment, um, which is a UK led approach to, to fusion, um, which has recently on, undergone a major upgrade. Uh, Nick's um, Twitter profile, I did some, some low level stalking before this talk. Uh, it describes him as a fusion expert, guitar obsessive and Cornishman. So I can hand you over safe in the knowledge that you're in good hands for tonight and I'll hand over to Nick now. Thank you very much, James. Um, I'm going to go ahead and assume that everyone can hear me unless I hear otherwise. Um, first off, thank you all for joining for this talk and uh, bearing with us when we, as we negotiated the interesting terrain that is organising something during the coronavirus pandemic. Um, it's wonderful to see so many of you here. And it's a really nice opportunity for me to be able to introduce you to Mast Upgrade. Um, Mast Upgrade and, and fusion and the field of fusion in general, I think, is so interesting um, and has so much delightful technology and interesting innovations that it's, it's really a, a great opportunity for me to be able to share that with you. Um, during the talk tonight, um, I actually look, I counted the slides I've put together um, and I noticed that only about half of them actually deal with Mast Upgrade in its own right. But what I wanted to give you was a bit of a flavour of the background, all, the background that goes into Mast Upgrade all the way from the background to Fusion itself, um, the kind of uh, evolution and journey that innovation went on um, to produce Mast Upgrade and then give you an idea of what actually Mast Upgrade is and what it will do for us and why it's so important and such a globally unique uh, and wonderful experiment to work on. So hopefully you'll bear with me over the next uh, 45 minutes or so and um, we can all enjoy it. Um, okay, brilliant. So I like to start all of my talks with the same image and it's this image and uh, you might be saying why why this image um, can uh, instantly can you see my uh, camera uh, let me just make sure I'm yes okay Brilliant. Um, so it's this image and the reason that it's uh, that it's this image is um, I think as a kind of, as a species, as a, as a human race, we have this, um, this approach to big problems. And I think this tends to be our approach. So for, and I, and I take climate change as an example. So um, we know climate change is a big issue. And I think all of us, hopefully everyone tuned in here will agree that climate change is an issue that, um, uh, that needs to be resolved. And uh, it's an issue that we are resolving. But if you, ask, if you ask me, certainly, and if you ask anyone on the street, um, what is your response to climate change? I think that the response is something like this chap in this photo. Um, we all know it's a big issue. We all know our house is on fire. Um, Greta Thunberg has a very nice uh, uh, way of putting it, that our house is on fire and we need to do something about it. But unfortunately, what most of us can do about it is go ahead and mow our lawn or uh, do our laundry or something like this um, or, or something to that analogy. And I'm no different. So I drive a diesel car. I know, it, I, know I shouldn't. I know I should upgrade to something more environmentally clean, but um, I drive a diesel car. Yet I recognize the importance. And I got to thinking, why, why is this my reaction? And I think it, my reaction is this because it's such an existential problem it's so hard to visualize the scale of the issue that we're actually trying to tackle um, and I've tried to put that scale into something that is actually visualizable in, in the next slide um, so I've taken here some data from the International Energy Agency um, which is a um, uh, an international agency dealing with all, all things to do with predicting um, energy uh, for future for our future and what you can see here is that uh, the IEA, who are the world experts on these things, tell us that by the year 2040, our energy consumption is going to increase. It's not going to increase at um, su such a high rate that it looks sort of 
exponential or anything like this, but it will increase. And this is primarily driven by uh, population growth, population growth in um, India, in China, um, and in developing nations. Now, of this increase in our energy demand, actually the prediction is that our dependence on carbon, our dependence on carbon-based fuels, which is supposed to be indicated here by these, um, these blue arrows, remains relatively flat, right? The, the gap between the arrows doesn't increase very much. Um, I, but then let's put some numbers to this. Well, the way that, they, the way that we measure uh, our energy dependency is in this unit called MTO, which sounds very strange. Um, MTO stands for million tons of oil equivalent. So it's essentially how many millions of tons of oil would I have had to burn in order to uh, produce this much energy? The amount of uh, million tons of oil, or the amount of tons of oil that we burned equivalent in carbon-based fuel in 2018 was 11 billion. That's 11 billion tons of oil. Now we know that actually, we don't just want our dependence on carbon-based fuel sources to level out because by the year 2100, that's going to be no good. We're still going to be relying heavily on, on carbon-based fuels. What we need to do is something that looks like this, where actually we transition our demand and our, um, our reliance on carbon-based fuels away from one another. So we go to a zero carbon energy supply um, and we want the arrows to do this. Unfortunately, what that means is that we have to displace 11 billion tons of oil we have to find some way of replacing the equivalent of 11 billion tons of oil and energy in order to meet this demand, in order to meet this target. And that is a phenomenally difficult thing to do. And like I said, it's, it's a really big problem, right? It's an existential uh, size and scale of problem. In order to do this, you, you're going to need something, um, you're going to need a solution which is uh, what sorry in order to do this what we would like is a solution that is safe we would like a solution that doesn't depend on carbon we would like a solution which is abundant so that we never have to worry about fuel resource um, and we and importantly we would like a solution which is baseload so we don't have to worry if our energy supply cuts out um, or anything like this and uh, nuclear fusion offers us just such a solution. So what is nuclear fusion? Uh, this is the sun, and the sun is a fusion reactor. Um, and we've known about fusion in the sun for many years. So uh, we always like to call Sir Arthur Stanley Eddington the pioneer of fusion, because back in 1920, he had the amazing, brilliant uh, breakthrough idea that actually at the core of the sun, fusion is driving all of the energy production um, and he said and his words put it better than mine could this reservoir and by that he means the energy at the center of the sun can scarcely be other than the subatomic energy which exists abundantly in all matter we sometimes dream that humanity will one day learn how to release this energy and use it for their surface the store is well nigh inexhaustible if only it could be tapped and what he's saying there is not that we need to plow in and mine the center of the sun. What he's saying there is that the processes at the center of the sun are so high yield in energy that if we could just tap into those processes, we could supply energy for ourselves for years and years to come. Now, at the time, this was quite a skeptical, there, there was a lot of skepticism towards this point of view. People didn't really know about fusion. They didn't really understand um, about the sun and how it's formed. And, but what everyone did understand is for, the, for these processes to occur, they needed a huge amount of energy. Now, Arthur Stanley Eddington um, uh, responded to this saying, we do not argue with the critic who urges that stars are not hot enough for this process. We tell them to go and find a hotter place, which I think is quite a robust uh, comment back to his critics there. And now it's a shame that Arthur Stanley Eddington uh, didn't survive past the 1940s. Because of course, now actually, uh, with all the um, breakthroughs in uh, cosmology, in astrophysics, in plasma physics, in everything we know, um, we now know that there are places in the universe that are hotter than the sun. There are, there are lots of places in the universe that are hotter than the sun. Um, we even know that there are places in our solar system that are hotter than the sun. And actually one of those is here. 
So this is the UK Atomic Energy Authority. This is uh, our site in this little uh, square box just here. And um, this is at Cullum in South Oxfordshire. And inside this building that I'm pointing to with this white arrow here is JET, which is one of our fusion machines. I'm not gonna talk about JET too much today, but inside JET, at the core of JET, we actually get temperatures which are 10 times hotter than the center of the sun. And we do fusion for a living. So fusion is possible and we can do it here on Earth. Now, what does fusion look like on Earth? Well, the fusion on Earth looks a bit different to, to the way it, do, it, it occurs in stars. And that's because the sun is actually a remarkably inefficient fusion reactor. On Earth, we, have to, we can't just rely on hydrogen fusion. We actually have to rely on some isotopes of hydrogen. So we use deuterium, which is one proton and one neutron, and tritium, which is one proton and two neutrons. These form helium, which is two protons, two neutrons, and a lonely neutron, which can fly off out of the vessel and eventually, um, conceptually, will go in and hit some sort of blanket around the outside um, and eventually power a steam turbine and generate electricity. So that's how we get electricity back from fusion. Now, um, deuterium itself is really, really readily abundant on Earth. And if you've drank, I've got a glass of water here just to keep, my, uh, keep, keep myself um, hydrated. And if I take a gulp of this water, about one in every 6,000 hydrogen atoms in that water is actually deuterium. So deuterium, we can get wherever we want. Uh, tritium, on the other hand, is difficult to come by. So tritium is a radioactive gas. Uh, it doesn't form naturally in nature. We can get it from um, nuclear reactors uh, in, in Canada, for example, but not in any major, not, not, not enough in a big enough supply to power a fusion reactor. So we have to do something about that. And it turns out that if you take lithium, uh, lithium is a metal that we can get uh, naturally. If you take lithium and you bombard lithium with neutrons, you can actually produce tritium as a byproduct. So if we put numbers to that, it means that if we take all of the deuterium in a bathtub of water, and all of the lithium in a laptop battery, we've got enough potential energy yield in the fuels there to um, match about 40 tonnes of burnt coal or about 250 kilograms of processed uranium ore in a fission reactor. So the energy yield from fusion is enormous and that really um, speaks to its huge potential. The problem is that it's really, really hard to do. So it's really hard to get to these temperatures, which are 10 times hotter than the center of the sun. It's really hard to do that in a controlled fashion. So how do we build a fusion reactor? Um, well, in the 1980s, uh, TV and uh, movies thought we built a fusion reactor like this by throwing banana skins into the back of a DeLorean. Um, unfortunately, that's somewhat uh, far from the truth. Um, in the 2000s, we thought we could build a fusion reactor, or science fiction thought that we could build a fusion reactor um, that could fit inside your chest, also somewhat far from the truth. But we can build fusion reactors. They don't look like this, they look like this. So this is a tokamak. A tokamak, uh, tokamak is a word that is an anagram, uh, sorry, not an, an acronym, of some Russian words, which I am certainly not going to embarrass myself by trying to pronounce. Um, although I'm sure someone on YouTube has done a much better job than me. Like, uh, like James said, I'm a Cornishman, and I think if I try and pronounce this, it'll just butcher it in some uh, vaguely Cornish accent. Um, but, but translated, this basically means toroidal chamber with magnetic coils, and that is essentially what a tokamak is. So a tokamak requires a few key, key things that make it a tokamak. Those are a plasma. So at the center of our machine, we have to have this burning, burning hot fuel, 10 times hotter than the center of the sun. Now, it turns out that uh, matter, gases, liquids, solids, whatever, they don't like to be at temperatures that are 10 times hotter than the center of the sun. Um, and instead of being a gas, a liquid or a solid, they form something called a plasma, which is actually a fourth state of matter. Um, and plasma is, is quite easy to understand. So if you, uh, every atom in a gas has a nucleus at the center, and it has electrons whirling around the nucleus. In a plasma, all that we've done is we've taken that nucleus, we've taken that electron, and they now move around independently of one another. They're no longer bound to each other. Um, and, uh, and when that happens, we have this state of matter called a plasma. And that happens when things get very hot, so our fusion happens in a plasma. So we have this plasma sitting at the center of our machine, but, uh, it's burning at 10 million degrees. 
so or 100 million degrees so we don't want this thing to touch material surfaces we have to find a way of keeping it bound in that space but without using materials to bind it there and the way we do that is we use extremely strong magnetic fields very very strong indeed um, this is the hand of our illustrious ceo uh, ian chapman demonstrating this so in, inside this glass container we have some plasma and ian is moving a permanent magnet around and you can see that the plasma responds to that magnet and that's because everything in the plasma is charged everything has a charge and charges respond to magnetic fields so we can create a cage essentially all this all this is is it's a donut shaped cage created by a magnetic field to hold that plasma in place and let it burn at 100 million degrees the other thing we have to have is a vacuum vessel so we could do this just in air just in atmosphere but that wouldn't work very well because um, all of the nasty things in air, the things that we really, really hate, like oxygen, uh, who likes oxygen, or water or nitrogen, um, they will get into our fuel and they dilute our fuel and mean that we can't do as much fusion. So we can't do it in air. We have to do it in a vacuum. And this is basically the fundamental uh, components that make up a tokamak. Now, there are a huge amount of stuff that goes in. And if anyone in the audience works on tokamaks, you'll know these things are way, way, way infinitely more complex than I'm making it seem here. But at its fundamental core, these components are what make a tokamak a tokamak. So, uh, excuse me. We've known about tokamaks for um, a number of years. So they emerged in Russia. They emerged in the 1950s in Russia and they were declassified in the 1960s. Um, and I'll show you a bit of a timeline later. So you could say, well, we've, we've known about tokamaks for 50, 60 years. Um, where are we now? Well, like I said, uh, in, in Russia, in the 1950s and 60s, this idea of a tokamak started to emerge. Um, it was at that time, there were lots and lots of different um, ideas on how you could do fusion being tested all around the world, some at Cullum, some at UKEA, um, and other places around the world. And all of them, all of them were falling flat on their face, except this one idea that came out of Russia called the tokamak. And when the Russians finally decided to declassify that research and send it out to the rest of the world, the world turned back to Russia and in um, classic Cold War era style said, well, we don't believe anything that you're saying. We think this is propaganda. And it was a team of scientists from UKAA that actually went over to Russia in collaboration, the first real major collaboration, international collaboration between the East and West in the Cold War era, and um, brought over a measurement device, stuck it on their machine, and measured the temperatures inside their machine. And it turned out that the temperatures they were measuring were easily 10 times hotter than anywhere else on the face of the planet at that time. And it's really in this phase that the world discovers that the tokamak is the way forwards. The tokamak is the most promising method for getting fusion off the ground. And this is a lovely drawing drew, drawn by the um, son of one of the Russian scientists during that mission, showing these uh, English scientists coming over and putting their measurement device in the Russian tokamak, which was called T3 at the time. So in the 1960s then, people, or in, in the late 1960s and early 1970s, the world suddenly starts to awake to the fact that the tokamak is the way forward and it starts to build big devices. This is something called the Princeton Large Taurus. And it, at, at its time, it was the biggest device in its day. And it was a kind of pioneering machine. It didn't achieve the kind of fusion goals it wanted. So um, America built a second device. And this was called TFTR. So TFTR is the Tokamak Fusion Test Reactor. This was built in America again. And this was supposed to produce more energy out than it put in. And it didn't do it. Um, and there were lots and lots of physics reasons why it didn't do it. Um, but fundamentally, it was its size. It need, you need a big machine to be able to produce more energy out than you put in. And the world recognized that you couldn't build one of these machines in isolation. So a big European um, project was um, enacted to build JET. And this is JET. JET is the Joint European Taurus. So it's operated at our lab in Cullum, but on behalf of the European Commission, um, 27 countries, or 28 now I think, pay into JET. And JET is the biggest machine in the world and it holds the world's record for fusion energy produced. But JET is not the end of the story. So where do you go after, you, after JET? Well, JET still hasn't produced more energy than, out than it's put in, but it's produced enough results and I'm promising enough results 
that now we can start scaling that up to a machine that is actually going to prove the principle. So this is ITER. ITER is being built in the south of France and it's just a monumental project in every sense of the word. So ITER is a um, partnership between these seven um, partners down here, so Europe, China, India, Japan, South Korea, Russia and the US. Um, not natural bedfellows you might say, so I think just getting all of these partners in one place at one time and partnering up is, is an achievement in itself. Um, around about 50% of all of the world's population is represented in ITER somehow um, through one of the partners. Let me just replay that video for you. And not, not just the population, but 90% of the world's economy is represented in ITER. And this represents just the scale and the magnitude of the challenge that ITER is trying to solve. So ITER's goal is to produce something called a plasma burn, which means that the heating inside the plasma itself from the fusion processes that are going on is enough to self-sustain the heat. So we, we, can get, we can get there by pumping in, say, uh, 50 megawatts of power, and ITO then will self-sustain itself, produce enough fusion that it will produce 500 megawatts of power out. And this we call a power gain. So, we, so ITO will produce 10 times the power out that we put in. And that is the headline goal of ITO. Um, ITO really is pushing technology to the very limits um, in every sense of the word. Just to give you two examples, um, the heating systems on ITO are so powerful that if you put a car in front of one of them, it would be vaporized within about 10 to 15 seconds. So they're very, very powerful heating systems. Um, and the magnet, the magnet at the center of ITER can produce such a strong magnetic impulse when it runs that if you put it above an aircraft carrier, this is an aircraft carrier on the sea, these massive, enormous ships. If you put the ITER magnet above an aircraft carrier, it could levitate that aircraft carrier. That's the scale of ITER. That's the scale of technology that we need to get this device off the ground. And we're doing it. The amazing thing is that we're actually doing it. Um, and ITER is due to come online in 2025. It's due to start doing major fusion research uh, in 2030. It's a really, really exciting project. And after ITER, where do you go from there? Well, then you start thinking, OK, we've proven that fusion works. Now we need to start putting electricity onto the grid. And that's what DEMO is designed to do. So DEMO is a European initiative. But there are lots of initiatives all around the world to try and um, take fusion and make it something that can actually produce power. Now, this is all great. So ITER sounds wonderful. But why, why have we taken so long to get there? Well, actually, um, the world has been doing pretty well with fusion. So some of you, many of you, I hope, will be um, familiar with Moore's Law. This, this uh, orange curve you can see here, this is Moore's Law. And what Moore's Law tells you is that every two years, I double the speed of my CPU chip. I double the number of transistors on an integrated circuit, but basically that tells me that my computer chip increases by about, gets twice as fast every two years. That's really cool. Uh, and and that's, this has worked um, right from the 1970s all the way up to 2010. Well, how am I doing in fusion? Well, I can take something called the fusion triple product. Don't worry about what this is. All you need to know really is that this fusion triple product basically says, if I was um, using deuterium and tritium in my reactor, how close to producing net fusion gain, how, how close to producing more power out than I put in would I be? And we can measure that. We can um, calculate that and measure that. And if you plot that on this same graph, it actually shows you that we're doing better than Moore's law. So fusion has uh, increased in performance at a faster pace than CPU uh, chips have, and even at a faster pace than particle accelerators have, right up until the 1990s and 2000s. So what's going on over here? Why is ITER so different? Well, the main difference really is that in the early phase, these are concept-defining experiments. They don't care about a lot of things, like they don't care about radioactivity, they don't care about waste, they don't care about um, dealing with tritium or but they care about it but not much um, they don't really have to worry about materials and things like this all of these problems come to bear when you start dealing with an energy producing reactor because all of a sudden you have a huge amount of tritium in your system and tritium is radioactive it's not nice to deal with all of a sudden you can no longer send humans in just to repair things because um, there's neutrons flying everywhere. So you can't send humans in. It's very damaging to um, our soft, squishy bodies. 
So you have to send robots in and we have to develop that technology as well. Um, you have to use superconductors in your magnets to produce, to get energy out of a reactor. And this, is, this shows the real difference. But what it shows us is that actually we're in the delivery era now. We're no longer in this concept defining experimental era. We're in the delivery era of fusion. And we hope to deliver fusion in the next um, 30, 20, 30 to 40 years. But the question is, is there another way? Is there a faster way or is there a cheaper way to do it? So ITER is brilliant. ITER is fantastic. I firmly believe ITER will work. And ITER has to, it is the solution, is the um, uh, proof that we need that fusion will work. But ITER is not the solution. And the reason that ITER is not the solution is cost. ITER is costing about 25 billion uh, euros, about $25 billion, which is about the same as um, three or four large hadron colliders. It's phenomenally expensive. And it's out of, out of the realms of possibility that that will produce something that is economically viable as a power plant. So the question then becomes, well, if ITER is not going to be economically viable, is there a better way? And out of the 1980s, this concept of a spherical tokamak started to emerge as a cheaper alternative. And I'm showing you here the difference between a conventional tokamak, something like ITER or JET, which is this large donut shape, and a spherical tokamak, something uh, smaller like mast upgrade, which is more, less like a donut and more like a cord apple. And we, start, we, we actually um, had the first major spherical tokamak here at uh, UKA in Cullum, and that was called Start, and this is a picture of it here on the left-hand side. And Start's bigger brother was Mast, and this is Mast that you can see here. Interestingly, a little aside for you, the light that you can see here, um, I don't know if anyone in the audience has ever done any solar astronomy, but when you do solar astronomy, you put a filter on the end of your telescope. And if you look through your telescope and you look through that filter, what you can actually see is only one wavelength of light. And that is the wavelength of light that comes when gas at the outside of a star hits the hot stuff on the inside and ionizes. And what you see then is the surface of the sun. So if you've ever seen a picture of the surface of the sun, you've seen this kind of light. And it's exactly the same light that we pick up in our tokamaks. So what you're seeing here in mast is the surface of our mini sun inside our machine. And I just think that's really, really cool. So this is mast. Why is cost so important? And why does the spherical tokamak in particular look like a more cost-effective route? Well, first off, um, let's, let's see what, what, what are the costs of fusion. Um, these are the names of some fusion experiments over the years and the amount of power that they um, potentially could produce and you see that the, the cost comes down as the power increases. And that's because the dominant cost of a fusion reactor is capital. It's mainly in how much it costs to actually build the damn thing. Now, ITER was supposed to uh, come online and be in this kind of cost bracket down here, which is in this gray shadowed region, which is roughly where we would need to be to be cost competitive with an energy market. But ITER is actually looking like it's being somewhere up here, like at almost one or two orders of magnitude higher then we'd need it to get there. And this is a problem. So where, what's driving these costs? This is a rather complicated um, diagram. Please don't worry about the details. Um, but, what I want to but what this does is it breaks down the cost in ETA, um, the projected cost in ETA, by different, uh, different things. And the biggest costs, four of the biggest costs, are in the magnets that go around the system and the cryostat that's needed to cool down those magnets. The site in the buildings are a big, big cost. And that's because all of the concrete that you need, it has to be nuclear grade concrete. And that is very expensive stuff to pour. It's very expensive stuff to produce. And the heating systems are a big cost. And part of that is because ITER is so big, you need a lot of heating systems to put enough power density into the machine to get it hot. And the blanket, the thing that sits around the outside of the machine, um, to create tritium and to get energy back, so the, the, the neutrons hit and create steam out of, is also a big, big cost. So what happens if we make the machine smaller? Well, if we make the machine smaller, the first thing we do is we make the magnets that we have to sit around the machine smaller. So that takes this cost down. That's really great news. The second thing it does is it means that the amount of the buildings that we have to lay with nuclear grade concrete goes down as well. And that's really good news because that takes this cost down. It means that the amount of heating we need to put in to get the same sort of power density in our plasma drastically reduces just because we've got a smaller volume. So this, this 
this part goes down. And it means that the amount of uh, space we need to cover with these blankets reduces as well. So this part goes down. So all of a sudden, just making the machine smaller reduces all of your top four major cost centers. So this becomes a really uh, potentially economic way of creating a token map. And um, not only does the cost go down, but it turns out that these machines are phenomenally uh, efficient to run. So this is, um, I, I thought I'd just stick this photo in here because I love this photo. This is Start. This is the Start vessel in the background. And these are the um, big five who, who really designed and built this machine. Start is a wonderful story of science because um, Start was built on a budget of about 200 thousand um, pounds and that is a small small budget for a science experiment of this kind of caliber and it was basically bought built by begging and borrowing and stealing all sorts of equipment left from other experiments and putting them together into this lovely thing called a spherical tokamak but start very quickly broke all sorts of records now this is another um, complicated graph that i've lifted out of some scientific text somewhere but what this is basically measuring is this something called beta. This funny B here is called beta. And what beta measures is the amount of pressure, so the, how much heat we can store in our plasma for a given amount of magnetic field. So say I have a magnetic field of one Tesla, which is uh, about um, a 100,000 or a million times more than the Earth's magnetic field. Say I have one Tesla of magnetic field. In a normal tokamak, this means that I can store uh, and this is a percentage scale, by the way, it means that I can store about one tenth of that magnetic field strength in pressure. And that's what we had here. And for a long time, before Start came online, people thought, right, that's brilliant. That's the record. We can't beat that. But when Start started operating, if you now look at all of these points from 1996 in blue crosses, in 97 in green circles, and in 98 in red dots, you see that Start absolutely smashed this record. So Start was able to hold on to 40% of all of that magnetic field strength in pressure inside the machine, which basically means that for the same amount of magnetic field, we can get a lot hotter in the center of our machine. And this is obviously good, right? Because the um, amount we have to spend on magnetic field is huge. So if we have to produce less magnetic field to get the same heat, that's another way of saving cost. Um, and I'm just going to go a bit physics-y on you. I am a physicist. I apologize. I'm going to get a bit physics-y on you here um, because you might be thinking, well, why on earth is that the case? And this is why. In a normal tokamak, the, um, the plasma sits quite far away from the center of the machine, which would be down here, right, at the center of this donut. And the magnetic field in any tokamak is strongest at the center and it decays as you go away. So it gets weaker and weaker and weaker as you go away from the center. And that has two effects. The first is that it, you need a stronger magnetic field to hold onto your plasma. But the second is that if I look at the actual shape of the magnetic field, and this black line here is the shape of the magnetic field in this tokamak, you can see that it spirals on the outside and it spirals on the inside. And that's fine. But now let's think about what's actually holding it in place. Well, we've got this burning plasma at the center and it wants to push outwards. We've got a magnetic field holding it inwards. But that magnetic field is looped around and in any loop, in any loop of magnetic field or in any loop in like a um, hula hoop or something, there's always a tendency for that loop to try and expand outwards. There's a tension in that loop and that loop wants to expand outwards. So if I have um, the pressure pushing outwards in this direction and I have the loop pushing outwards as well in that direction, then I have two things pushing outwards and that makes it harder to confine. But if I have the pressure pushing outwards, but the loop pushing inwards or, or the sorry the pressure pushing inwards but the loop pushing outwards these two things are now pushing against one another and that makes it easier to keep the plasma in place now it turns out that in the conventional machine i have about the same number of loops on the inside where it's easy to keep the plasma in place as i do on the outside but in a spherical tokamak as we see on the right hand side i have many 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 more loops of, pla of, of magnetic field on the inside than i do on the outside of the machine so that means I have many more loops in the part of the machine where it's easy to keep stuff in place. And I have uh, fewer loops on the part of the machine where it's harder to keep stuff in place. So that means that I naturally get this effect where it's easier for me to confine my plasma. It's easier for me to keep the whole thing in place just by virtue of the fact that I have a smaller plasma. 
So Start was so successful that that prompted investment in the spherical tokamak. And the bigger brother of Start was MAST. So MAST stands for Mega Ampere Spherical Tokamak. Mega Ampere is just the amount of current that we put into the machine. And this is the MAST machine. And this is what MAST looks like on the inside. And this is a little movie um, that I've got playing of MAST. One of the beautiful things about MAST was that it was this big, wide open chamber um, which meant that you can take lovely, lovely uh, photographs and lovely videos of the whole machine. So that's what I'm showing you here. MAST was very successful. So MAST ran from uh, about 2000 to 2013. We ran about 30,000 uh, different uh, experiments in MAST um, and it did very well for itself. It showed that the spherical tokamak can be upgraded, it can be upscaled and still maintain all of those benefits that we, that we showed were so important in START. Also, interestingly in MAST, one of the other major um, innovations in this machine is that um, normally in any tokamak, all of your magnetic field coils, these things that are in red that produce the magnetic field, are outside of the vacuum vessel. They're very far from the plasma. But in MAST, because everything is so squished down to the center and space is such a premium, we put these inside the vacuum vessel. And that has two good things. First off, it puts them closer to the plasma. So that's great because that means the magnetic field is closer to the plasma, so we need less magnetic field. Good. Um, but secondly, it means that we can build our vacuum vessel in a very simple shape, and it basically is a giant can. So it's a giant tin can, and not tin, stainless steel can, um, and we can disassemble the top, we can disassemble the bottom, and the plasma just sits inside this can. Now this is great, this makes it very uh, easy to operate, but more importantly than that, it means that we have a whole load of real estate inside this vessel that we can easily access and we can easily engineer. And that is why MAST was such a good candidate for being upgraded. And that's why the MAST upgrade project got kicked off. So um, the problem, of course, that all of these things come with problems, right? You make something smaller, um, fine. But our thing is burning at 150 million degrees. Now, imagine I've taken all of the, that heat and put it in an even smaller space. Well, the intensity with which that heat is delivered to material surfaces is going to be enormous now. And we, th we think in fusion in, at UKA, we think there are basically six major challenges that require significant innovation in order to solve that are in the way of fusion. And um, we have to get stuff hot. And that's what I mean here by burning plasmas. We have to get things as hot as they can get. We have to build our machine out of materials that can withstand the environment that we're putting them in. We need to make sure that we produce enough tritium that we can keep the fusion reactor going. And like I said before, we need to make sure that we can uh, maintain it and we can repair it all robotically, all without sending humans into the loop. And finally, uh, well, not finally, and we have to do all of these things in an integrated holistic manner. So we have to design the whole machine so that everything fits together and, um, and we don't have a, a case where the robotic maintenance systems mean that we cannot long, can no longer breed tritium. But among all of these challenges, perhaps one of the most intense is number three, which is removing this excess heat. So this is already a big challenge, right? We have 150 million degrees at the center of our machine and about, um, about three or four meters away, we have to be at the temperature of a wall or liquid nitrogen in some cases. Now, um, nature does not like this, right? So let's think about a star, let's think about the sun. The sun is about 15 million degrees, at its surface, it's about 5,000 degrees. In order to get the temperature to drop off, the sun has to be the size it is, and the sun is enormous. Um, it's certainly many, 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 many times bigger than the, uh, the size of the Earth. Now, we're trying to do something even worse than that, so we're trying to get from 10 times hotter than the center of the sun to 1,000 times cooler than the surface of the sun in a space of meters. That's our challenge. And obviously that's a very hard thing to do. And what that tends to mean is that we're putting very, very high heat fluxes onto our material surfaces. In present day machines, that heat is around about uh, a, a heat flux of five megawatts per meter squared. Now, this is a unit that we use to describe um, heat flux. Don't worry about the unit. Um, to put that into context for you, a diesel combustion engine, and I drive a diesel, like I was saying before, the peak heat flux in a diesel combustion engine is about 10 megawatts per meter squared. So we can be reasonably assured that uh, this is fine. This is tolerable and survivable. Um, in ITER, 
we expect this to start verging on around about 100 megawatts per meter squared, which is the same sort of heat flux that a space shuttle feels as it's re-entering the atmosphere. Anyone that knows anything about space shuttles will know that they have this armor called ablative armor. And what ablative armor does is it heats up and it destroys itself to protect the more vulnerable components underneath. This is not somewhere we want to be with a fusion reactor, right? We do not want a fusion reactor that is going to destroy itself in order to protect itself because we're just going to have to go in and repair it. And that is a lengthy process that all the time is being used up where we could produce uh, useful fusion energy. Now, when we start thinking about even bigger reactors in the future, like DEMO, we get up into this kind of territory around here about 400 to 1,000 megawatts per meter squared. And this is the sort of territory that an arc welder operates in. Arc welders are fundamentally designed to destroy the uh, materials that they are dealing with. We do not want to be in that kind of category. Now, the problem is when we try and make predictions for where a reactor will sit, it's anywhere in this range. So we need to come up with a solution for our reactor design that brings down this range into this nice green area, which is tolerable and means that we no longer have to worry about heat exhaust systems that are going to be like an arc welder. And this is an Im immense challenge, but this is fundamental to the mission of mast upgrade and fundamentally what mast upgrade is designed to try and resolve. So mast upgrade has three primary objectives. These are in a bit of science speak, but I'll try and um, uh, uh, translate them a bit for you. Um, the first primary objective and top mission of mast upgrade is to develop novel exhaust concepts. So this is doing exactly what I just said. It's to develop ways of getting rid of this excess heat that we don't know how to deal with um, in a manner that is safe to the machine and in a manner that we think could scale up and actually be a solution in a fusion reactor. And I cannot stress this enough. If we do not come up with these solutions, fusion cannot go ahead. This is an innovation that is absolutely required for fusion to go ahead. It is a um, challenge that every single approach to fusion will knock up against. And we need to create, we need to find the solution. And Mast Upgrade is investigating just that solution. On top of that, there's a lot of physics that we can do in Mast Upgrade, which will directly feed into the knowledge basis for ETA. So a lot of the experiments that we're going to do in this machine will feed the knowledge base for ETA and provide um, uh, more and more understanding of the basic fundamental processes that go on inside a tokamak so that when ETA comes online, it is a success from day one. And that is really, really important. And finally, we want to show with Mast Upgrade that actually you could build a reactor that looks like a spherical tokamak. You don't need to build a reactor that looks like ETA. And the way that we do this is we show that we can do everything that a reactor like JET or ETA can do in this machine, but we can deal with those high heat fluxes. We can deal with that really intense heat that only gets worse when you make stuff smaller. And I'll talk a bit about STEP at the end. So STEP is a UK initiative to try and design a uh, fusion reactor based on this spherical tokamak concept. So where are we with Mast Upgrade? Um, Mast Upgrade, the actual project really kicked off in 2008 um, when we started designing the machine and started designing this concept of something called the Super X Diverter. And the Super X Diverter is the name that we give to this heat exhaust system, this um, innovative system for removing excess heat. So this kicked off in January 2008 um, and we were approved for construction back in April 2010, so a long time ago. Um, in October 2013, MAST, MAST ran its final experiment. It, was, it ceased its operations and we started taking the machine apart. And in 2014, the whole thing was disassembled and we were ready to start building the new machine. In 2018, the whole machine was then was, had been reassembled, uh, it was all in place, and we had a handover from construction, so we were no longer building the machine, we were now starting to figure out how to operate the machine, and that was back in April 2018. And here we are today in 2020, and um, uh, I, if, if I'd have given this talk before we all um, had, uh, were forced to work from home, I'd have told you that we were tantalizingly close to producing the first plasmas in mast upgrade, and they would be later this year. Um, please take that with a pinch of salt because uh, depending on when we get back, it might be this year, it might be next year, but we are tantalizingly close now to the first plasmas in mast upgrade just before, the week or so before we were forced to cease operations and work from home, we'd run the first ever currents in the magnetic field coils inside mast upgrade. 
so we, we're making really really good progress um and uh and we're well on the path to getting master upgrade ready and up and running um, and I've just got these design, these key phases down the bottom here. And we're now in this commissioning phase, which is we're preparing the machine to be up and running again and start running plasmas. Um, just a few nice milestones along the way. So this is what the vessel looks like um, on the left hand side here. This is what mass looks like. It's about four meters tall. It's about four meters across. Like I said, it's a can. And this is what it looks like on the inside. Um, so it's, it's, it's all of these black surfaces are carbon. So there are layered graphite surfaces and graphite is very good for handling heat because graphite doesn't melt, it sublimes away, which basically means it gives itself weight atom by atom. So, that, so most of our inner surfaces are, gra are graphite and you can see all of the coils on the inside of our machine here and these circular coils here. So that's what the inside looks like. In 2018, um, when we had handed over operations to construction, um, the, we were very lucky to host His Royal Highness Prince William, who came down and he pushed the big red button. And the big red button put the first ever plasma in mast upgrade. Now, this plasma was not fusion plasma. It was cold. Um, it was sort of room temperature plasma. But we used these kind of plasmas to clean the inside of the machine. And uh, he was lucky. He was, uh, we were fortunate enough to be able to host Prince William and for him to be the first person really to get the machine up and running. Um, and in August 2019, we hosted the, the um, Prime Minister, who came down and is, was very, very supportive of our mission and was keen to see the progress that we were making uh, towards getting Master Upgrade up and running. So what can the machine do? Well, um, first off, on the left-hand side, I'm showing you the difference between Mast on the left and Master Upgrade on the right. But what actually goes into Master Upgrade? Well, we've got, first off, the first thing to say, is that we have kind of two different uh, levels of mast upgrade. We have the core scope, which is what is uh, what are we funding? What's the UK government funding in at the moment um, upgrading in mast upgrade? And um, again, this is this was lifted from a different presentation, so it's a bit sciencey, but I'll go through these. First off, we have increased magnetic field. So TF here stands for toroidal field. We have increased magnetic field, and this is really good because I as I told you, the amount of heat that we can contain inside our machine is kind of determined by the amount of magnetic field that we have. If we can get 40% of that magnetic field into heat, then the more field we can have, the more heat we can put in our machine and the hotter we can get our plasmas. So that's great. We have a new solenoid and that's this thing that sits down the center of our machine. We've got a brand new one of these and this means that we can put more current into our plasma, but importantly, it means we can run our machine for longer. So previously, an experiment on mast would last um, only about as long as uh, half a second. So when you're running an experiment, it, it's, it's very, I, I ran a number of experiments on mast, and it always ends this way. You spend months and months preparing this wonderful experiment that's going to change the world of fusion. You get to the machine on the day, and you have these, this real anticipation as the countdown um, goes on, hits zero, and then click of the finger, and your experiment's done. Um, and that's what mass used to be like. Now, it's very, very hot, right? So a lot of physics can happen in half a second. But with our new solenoid, this new thing down the center, we should be able to run the machine for up between two and five seconds. So up to 10 times longer than we were able to run it before. And 10 times longer means 10 times more physics, means 10 times better um, answers to all of the questions that we need. It's got 19 new coils. Uh, let me just go through these, sorry. It's got 19 new coils all around the inside of the machine. And this means that we can really play around with the magnetic field that's inside our machine. We can do really, really cool stuff with the magnetic field. We can turn it into all sorts of weird and wacky shapes. And we can start investigating if we tweak the field in one part of the machine, or if we tweak it in another, how does that impact the performance of the machine? We've got this thing called the Super X Diverter. And this is the real headline article. This is the um, chamber where we're now going to put all of our heat um, in the machine. And we hope that this chamber has been designed with all of the infrastructure around it in such a way that we massively reduce the amount of heat that actually hits the material surface. And we think that this is a potential solution for reactors of the future to be able to deal with this um, excess heat problem. Um, and we've got extra heating, which I won't talk about here. What does this all mean practically? Well, what this means practically is that our vessel now weighs nearly 80 tons more than it did before, or sorry, 90 tons more than it did before. We've got well over 130,000 new components inside this machine. 
25,000 of these different fixings. We've got over 120 kilometers of cabling that goes into this machine and over two kilometers of just pipes for fueling the machine in different places. It's really a phenomenally uh, complex project that's taken a lot of engineering to get off the ground. And this is a bit, a few pictures of um, the upper and lower diverter, the upper and lower super X diverter getting put into place. And here's our new center column being dropped down. I'm just going to skip over this. Um, now I've spoken a bit about the super X diverter. The super X diverter is very rightly a um, absolute focus of the machine going forwards. And three of our top five experimental goals for the first experimental campaign of mast upgrade are focused around this super X diverter. We want to look at things like um, how does the diverter, how does this chamber stop the, uh, affect the amount of power or the amount of particles that we're putting down onto machine surfaces. We also want to know how does having this chamber inside the machine affect the performance of the rest of the machine? So can we still keep hot stuff hot, even though we're getting all the cold stuff cold? And finally, we want to know, did we design the machine in the right way or do we need to change around the uh, design of the machine in order to um, make things better? And I'd just like to talk to you, um, leave you the final uh, word on why, why is this so good? Well, we've done a lot of work to run uh, very complicated codes and try and look at what, happen, what we think will happen inside the plasma when we have this chamber in the machine. And what I'm showing you here is one of these codes which shows the temperature that we expect inside the plasma. Now the fusion, all of, we, well, we don't do fusion on mass upgrade, but all of the hot stuff is up here, right? In this red portion here. And what we really want to do is keep this material surface down here where the plasma is touching as blue as possible. And it turns out that actually in all of our codes, when we run them through, say that as we put more and more fuel into the machine, as we put more fuel and more heat into the machine, this thing gets colder and colder and colder. And this is really good news. And it's good news for a number of reasons. Um, first off, this happens because all of the time that the plasma is touching the material surface, all of the time you're putting heat down onto that material surface, that material surface is giving itself back to the plasma, right? It's, it's melting or it's um, subliming away. Basically, you get little bits of that material come back into the plasma. Now, anything that is not plasma that hits the plasma creates light. And in our game, light is energy, energy is fusion. Um, so the more light that gets into the plasma, the colder the plasma gets, the less fusion we can do. So what happens then if we make this into a chamber? Well, now we're doing something really innovative, right? We're separating out the bit of the plasma that we want to keep cold from the bit of the plasma that we want to keep hot. And we're doing that with a really, really narrow gap here, right? We've got a small throat here and things just cannot get back up into this hot part of the plasma. It's kind of like I always say, it's like imagining you're trying to um, throw a piece of grit up a hose whilst the hose has water coming out of the end of it. You just can't do it. You try and throw it up there and it just gets whooshed back down, right? So that's what's going on in here. So we've now got this situation where all of this light that's being produced from all of these nasty bits that come off the surface is being contained in this region of the plasma where we want to keep things cold. And this region of the plasma that we want to keep things hot is staying hot because we no longer have a lot of the stuff that would normally go in and cool it. So we've got this situation now where we can keep the hot stuff hot and importantly, we can keep the cold stuff cold. And that is exactly the position that we want to be in for a fusion reactor. That's exactly what we want to do in a fusion reactor. And that's exactly what we're testing here on Master Upgrade. And that is why Master Upgrade is so important because we have this solution that we think will work. Now we need to test it. And that is the goal for Master Upgrade. So what comes after Mast Upgrade? Well, Mast Upgrade, if it works, and we hope that it will work, will show us that actually the spherical tokamak is a real player. It's a real way that we could start to design a reactor that looks like Mast Upgrade, but on a bigger scale. And very recently, you may have seen in the press, if you're interested, um, we received, we, the government announced a £220 million package of funding to start designing just such a machine. And this machine is called STEP. It's called the Spherical Tokamak for energy production. Now, this 220 million pounds will not build a machine, but what it will produce is a design concept. It'll produce a design concept, which we think has all of the physics it needs, all of the engineering it needs, and all of the technological 
um, development it needs to be able to that if we could build that design concept it would produce electricity and step will link to the grid so the end goal of the step project is to create a spherical tokamak based energy producing reactor that links to the electricity grid li links to the national supply and actually puts electricity on the grid by 2040 and mast upgrade is a key player in this right you can see that inside step we have these super x diverted chambers Mast upgrade is a key player here and it's testing the physics that we need to test to be able to do this. Um, and please, please look out in the press in three or four years time once this program starts to become to the end of its first phase. It's very, very exciting and we're really, really leading the world on this. So that's the end of my talk. Um, I've, I've run over a little bit. Um, hopefully we have time, a little bit of time to answer some questions. If you want to find out any more on any of this, there are um, various websites. I've got um, ccfe.uka.uk here this is you can find out all the stuff about mass upgrade on here um, eurofusion is a big european funding partner of mass upgrade so please take a look there on their website we've got all of the social media um, so please link to us on social media this is my uh, email address if there's anything you'd like to ask um, in relation to this that i can't cover in the q a please feel free to contact me or connect with me on linkedin um, i'm on linkedin all the time so connect with me and um, feel free to ask me any questions or um, uh, anything related to fusion in general, I'm always willing to help. So with that, uh, I'll come to an end and I'll hand back to James, who I think is going to uh, take us through some of the Q&A. Hello, Nick, hopefully I've reappeared. Um, thank you very much for that talk. Um, I'd normally ask for a round of applause now, but I don't think you'd hear it. But uh, at home, if you feel like giving Nick a round of applause, please do. Um, Right, yeah, so we've had uh, quite a few questions come through um, and I will, I'll try and try and pass them on as best I can. So um, we've had a few questions which I'll, I'll try and sort of put into to one around um, really the, the, the time scales for fusion and how it compares to uh, other renewables such as, um, sorry, someone else is inviting me on a Zoom call, uh, <laughs> how it combines with other other um, energy sources such as renewables, um, particularly in relation to the to the fight um, against climate change. So. Muted. I knew I knew I would catch myself out by <laughs> muting myself by accident at some point during this talk. Um, yeah, that's a really really good question. So time scale of uh, of renewables and what how can fusion can fusion impact uh, on climate change in a reasonable kind of time. Um, the way that I answer this really is that um, no, fusion will not make a big contribution by 2050. The technological readiness is not there um, and it won't be there. And we, um, without major, major increases in funding, uh, it can't be done. But um, we have to look beyond 2050. And hopefully that graph that I showed you in the first, um, in the first few slides shows you that without, we, we can't just, we can't just think of 2050 and leave it there. We have to come up with a solution that is going to be able to address all of the energy issues that come uh, alongside climate change, alongside a population which is going to be growing exponentially. Now it's likely that renewables will certainly play a big, big role going forwards. And maybe 80% of all of the energy that the world produces after 2050 might be in renewables. And, and that's a good thing and that should be there. But the problem with renewables is storage, right? You, what happens if the sun isn't shining? What happens if the wind isn't blowing? Or um, you can't guarantee on the tidal behavior? You have to store that energy somewhere. And if you're 80% reliant on renewables, then you have to store 20% if you want to be 100% reliable on renewables. And 20% of the world's energy supply is enormous. So renewables cannot solve the problem on their own. And that problem only gets worse um, the, the, the bigger the population. In addition, uh, areas like India um, and it, some places in Africa and certainly in China have um, population densities which far exceed what we deal with here in Britain. Um, although you might not believe it if you live in uh, central London or travel into Oxford and take the, commute, uh, the commuting times into account, but they do. Um, so in, in Britain, we, could, we probably won't need fusion, right? Let's, let's put our cards on the table. We probably won't need fusion in Britain. We've probably got enough offshore wind and other energy supplies that could tide us over. But India, China, 
with their population densities, the kind, the amount of land use they would need to take up with renewables just to be able to um, supply one of their cities is enormous and completely impractical. So India needs some sort of energy supply, um, which has high energy yield for a small amount of land use. And that is exactly what fusion is. The alternative to fusion, of course, there is nuclear energy, uh, nuclear fission energy. But that comes with all sorts of other um, issues related to nuclear proliferation um, and safety that nuclear fusion doesn't have. In addition, uh, there aren't massively more, uh, much more abundancy of uh, fuels for nuclear fission on Earth than there are fossil fuels. So you still have this energy, um, uh, you still have this fuel source problem. So fusion answers a lot of these questions. It's baseload, right? So it fits underneath a portfolio of renewables and it can support that without the need for energy storage. You can turn it on and off as you want or you can keep it running and it's high energy density. So I think that's where fusion will sit in the energy landscape. Um, there is absolutely no way that we will get anywhere near so, um, providing a solution for climate change without a major investment in renewables and a major effort to get renewables on the table. But likewise, there is no way that we will um, get to 2100 with um, any kind of reasonable energy solution without investing in other technologies. And fusion is the technology that we need to get us there. Thanks, Andy. Um, a, a very comprehensive answer. Hopefully that uh, covered uh, quite a few of the questions. Um, so, so another, uh, again, a few questions that I'll, I'll try and put together into one. Um, effectively, you, you said a lot of um, positive things about how good a spherical tokamak is. So there, there are two parts to the question. One is, why did we spend so much time looking at larger tokamaks? In particular, why has ETA built that large? Are there any advantages to an eater like design over the spherical tokamak? Um, uh, okay, so I, I guess I should, uh, you, you probably guessed from my talk that I have my background in spherical tokamaks. So uh, I have a um, vested interest in them, but I'll try and be as unbiased as I can. So eater is great. Um, and the greatest thing about eater is that we're pretty sure it will work because eater is built on, excuse me, essentially the same design it goes all the way back to the 1960s. Uh, so it is different. It's different in a number of major ways. But essentially, the mature, that design has been maturing since the 1960s. So we have um, 60 years of maturity in that design. And that's why um, ETA looks like, we're pretty sure ETA will work. Now ETA, the design for ETA came, uh, started being built up, started being designed up in the 1980s, early 1980s. So before spherical tokamaks were even a twinkle in the eye of Martin Peng, who was the inventor of the spherical tokamak, ETA was already being designed. And it had to be designed based on technology of the time and, and designs of the time. So the spherical tokamak wasn't there. Um, the spherical tokamak came along and um, looked promising, but not many people really took it seriously. And the reason that not many people took it seriously was because people looked at it and they said, yeah, that's great, right? You can beat these records, you can do all that, but how on earth do you handle that heat? Because you just make the problem worse. You, you take an eater, all of the heat and eater, and you push it into a smaller box. All you've done is intensify a problem that is already pretty bad. Um, so that's what the rest of the world set, looked on and said. And, and, and at Cullum, at UKA, we kind of held our hands up and we said, yep, OK, fair enough. Unless we can solve this, it's a no-goer. So people put their heads down, started innovating, and came up with this design that we think can solve it. And that's what the super X diverter is. That's why master upgrade is so important. Um, and that's why ETA looks the way it does, because ETA is a reliable design that will work. Um, mast upgrade is a reliable design that we think will work, and we hope to prove that it will work, but it's uh, some way off the level of maturity of ETA. Okay, thank you for that. Um, right, the, ne the next question, um, again, raised by, raised by a few people, is um, the the thing we're all talking about before coronavirus uh, occupied the news, which is Brexit. There was a there was a time before coronavirus. I there think. was a time before coronavirus. Yes, um, and and the question is uh, how that will affect uh, the UK's involvement in ETA and how it will affect um, something like Mast or Step. Yeah, that's that's a really um, that's a really really good question. Um, Interestingly, before this talk, uh, only about half an hour before I tuned into this talk, I was on a talk from um, our senior person in the government who was responsible for fusion in the UK. And he was uh, asked exactly this. And his response was basically, um, 
to paraphrase, was we are in a bit of a distinguished position because we are, UK are world leaders in fusion and there isn't really an argument against that. Um, we operate the biggest m machine in the world. We operate the best spherical tokamak in the world. We are world leaders in fusion and we have a lot of expertise that ETA needs and we gain a lot from being part of ETA. So there is mutual need to remain in contact and we can be part of ETA without being part of the European Union. So um, all, we, we need to be part of Euratom which is um, separate to the European Union, but, we, but negotiations are running in parallel, but we don't need to be part of um, the European Union, Union itself. So we can still participate in ETA and we really strongly expect to be participants in ETA um, as long as we can agree this framework uh, in order to do that. And there is strong will from both sides in order to, do, in order to get that in place. So the, my government colleague was not in the slightest bit worried about uh, the status of ETA. We, we expect to be still playing a significant role there and, and ETA want us to because we're good at what we do. Um, now, Master and STEP, that's, that's an interesting point. Um, so STEP itself is a UK programme. STEP does, is, is really um, all about bringing all of the knowledge in the UK together in universities, at UKAA and other labs and uh, industry in the UK to build this device. So, so STEP is, um, essentially it's our, our, our answer to, to this problem um, and it's bringing all that expertise in-house as well and trying to produce something in-house. Master Upgrade has some European um, funding to it. That's all underwritten. We don't expect that to be a problem. Um, and we fully intend to collaborate with our European partners when Master Upgrade comes online. There's a huge amount of interest in Europe. Um, I, I changed jobs at UK recently, but before I changed jobs, I was in charge of a set of experiments which are being designed to be carried out uh, in exactly the same way on two machines in Europe and one machine in Master Upgrade. Um, one machine, sorry, Master Upgrade in the UK. So there's a lot of interest there. Um, and again, we don't expect that to drop. The, um, the only, I mean, obviously this is all subject to political negotiations and remaining with some sort of association agreement in place in Euratom. But um, the will is there, the intention is there, we can just uh, sit and hope that that all comes to fruition. Thanks, Nick. Um, I'm still getting questions coming in, so I'll, I'll do a couple more um, if you're happy to keep taking them. Yes, yeah, I'm happy, yeah, okay. yeah no problem. Brilliant. Um, okay, so um, hopefully this one's, this one's relatively easy. Uh, a question, what happens to the helium produced in fusion? Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a nice question. Um, yeah, so helium is essentially, it's a waste product of our reaction. So what will happen is that helium will get produced in the core of where the fusion goes on. It will slowly migrate its way out. And like all the rest of the plasma, it will come down and it'll um, hit some uh, material surface somewhere. Once it does that, it will either bounce back off that material surface as a gas, no longer a plasma, as a gas, and it will get pumped away. Um, or it will embed itself in the material surface and we will reclaim it after the machine is shut down and that will get pumped away. Um, but yeah, so it will all get removed out and um, probably it, it, fusion reactors will start becoming a stock of helium for the world because actually, interestingly, helium is a bit of a dwindling resource at the moment. Um, but yeah, so the, the short answer is um, we aim to pump it all out and um, use it for other means. Thank you. Um... So, so two, two questions, hopefully short ones again, um, about the interaction between conventional tokamaks and, and um, spherical tokamaks. The first was, could you use a Super X diverter on a conventional tokamak? And the second part is, do you feel um, a sense of rivalry between the two <laughs> technologies? <laughs> oh, what a good question. Um, I think that there is a sense of um, friendly rivalry, shall we say. There are records are there to be broken, and um, but I think within the field there isn't really. It's not really a case of one or the other. Um, it, I mean, the, the spherical tokamak and the conventional tokamak are sufficiently close to one another that actually an awful lot of the physics that you do on one translates directly over to the other. Um, so a lot of the research we do on mast will support ETA. A lot of the research that gets done on jet supports mass. So there's, I mean, there's, yeah, really, it's only very friendly rivalry. I've, I've worked on four tokamaks in my career. One of them is a spherical tokamak. Three of them were conventional tokamak. And I didn't really change the way I was doing anything to work on one or the other. Um, 
in ter- and the other thing I'll say is there are there are many there are actually many approaches to fusion on the face of the earth. Um, the tokamak is the most promising, but uh, there are lots of other approaches to fusion. And I would say that from our perspective, at least, um, we encourage this. Right, the, the more people that are working on fusion, the better. Fusion will take massive innovation to work, and it takes very very clever people to get that to work. So the more clever people that are thinking about fusion, the better. Um, in terms, so super X diverter on a conventional tokamak, yes, it. You could do that and um, you will get a lot of the benefits you'll get, but there are certain benefits that you don't get as well. So one of those is that um, when, you are, when, when you're putting heat down onto a surface, and I'll try and explain this as simple as I can. When you're putting heat down to the surface, it comes down like this and it, it, it's basically a ring all the way around the machine. And the ring, the ring has a certain width to it. And the width of that ring tells you how intense that heat is, right? If I'm putting it in a really small width, then I have a really intense source of heat going down to that surface. Now, in a spherical tokamak, if I move that, the point of contact a bit further out, then that's like going from a radius of one meter to a radius of one and a half meters. So that's an increase by a factor of 50%. So that means I reduce my heat flux. I reduce the amount of heat that's going down to my target sorry, going onto my material surface by about 50%. If I do that in a um, conventional tokamak, then I might have a change in radius from about, I don't know, four meters to four and a half meters. So that's a, um, only a factor one eighth, right? That's, that's an increase by one eighth. So I completely lose out on most of that improvement you get from that i still get all of the benefits of having that chamber of having everything closed off but i lose out on that benefit of having um a big change in the radius so the, so you could do it um but you get maximum benefit from that approach by having this spherical document okay thank you um i'm just going to step up I, i'll keep taking questions just bear with me for two seconds i'm going to turn a light on because it's getting a bit dark okay no problem. I was uh, dangerously close to showing everyone here that I'm actually wearing tracksuit bottoms and a shirt. <laughs> Brilliant. Okay, so um, again, an amalgamation that I'll, I'll paraphrase. So um, you talked about how um, the work on Master U will feed into the next step, which will be step. There are a lot of questions relating to when will that route resolve in an economically viable um, source of energy yeah great question um the first thing i'll say to defend fusion a bit well i'll tell you what the first thing i say will not defend fusion um the first fusion reactor will not be economically viable probably the, th- the second and the third won't be economically viable either but the tenth once we built 10 of them and we know how to build them for cheap then it might start to become really viable that companies can start building these things on their own and making money out of them um, but oh my God, it's gonna take 10 fusion reactors before we can do that, that's awful. Um, Well, I think if you look back in history at all of the different ways that energy has entered the market, um, be it in coal plants, in oil burning, in gas, in steam, in uh, offshore wind, in solar, every single entry into market from any energy source has always had strong public subsidy because it has never been economically viable to introduce an energy source into the market on its own. The reason is because when you build the first or the second or the third, you're still developing the technology. You're still tuning it and making it right. And that makes it very expensive because you're probably building something that no one else has ever built. So you're doing all of the things that make it very hard to do. Um, And that means that any company that's going to do that is going to say, well, I'm only going to do that if the government foots the bill for a significant um, amount of the capital so fusion will probably enter the market with strong public subsidy um, and that's that's an expected thing but what we can do from our for our end of that is say right that's going to happen it's going to be expensive when it comes to the market but what we can do in the meantime is try and build a machine which is as economic as it possibly can be and we can try and factor that into our machine design now so that the um, route to market is as short as possible and uh, uh, there was a study which was done which said that um, by 2100 a conventional tokamak based fusion reactor 
will probably have penetrated about 10% of the energy market, which is extraordinary, right? That's fantastic. But it, about 10%. Um, this is a zero carbon energy market. In the same study, they said, well, what would happen if we could build that based on a reduced cost design, like based on a spherical tokamak? And that increases it up to about 40%. So 40% of market penetration. Um, so that shows you the power of making this machine more economic. And that's probably the best way I can answer that, but it will be expensive and it will require public subsidy, but I think there will be political will to do so because it really is the golden egg, right? It's, or it's the golden goose um, that lays the golden egg because it produces this energy, which is clean, safe, reliable, carbon free and abundant. Thanks for that. Um, another, another great answer. Okay. So, um, let me try and uh, again collect a few together. We so you've talked about um, the the approach to fusion using tokamaks. Mm -hmm. So there is a, a question, a, a various questions citing different approaches. Mm -hmm. um, one of them being uh, approaches by private companies to mm -hmm. to attempt fusion, uh, laser based inertial confinement fusion, and someone has asked about the possibility of cold fusion. Mm -hmm. um, there are, there are three three areas I mentioned there. Just uh, yep. if you could mention a quick things on your on your thoughts on those three kind of alternative ways to fusion. Yeah, sure. So uh, first off, I think I um, said before that the more people working on fusion, the better. So any 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 work on any approach to fusion is not bad work. Um, and the more people thinking about the problem, the better. And I think we would welcome that. Um, let's start with uh, cold fusion. As I understand it, and I don't much know much about the field um, as it stands now, uh, but as I understand it, the only real um, scientifically viable approaches to cold fusion rely on something called muon catalyzed fusion, which um, the fuel source for which is uh, phenomenally hard to produce and uh, absolutely makes it, as I understand it, a non-goer unless you can produce um, some way of producing these kind of muons that are needed to get the thing up and running so that's my understanding of it not an expert i like hot fusion um so i'm afraid i can't really answer that one much further than that um now the question on um private approaches to fusion and uh, in fact i'll take the private and the laser approaches in the same in the same um breath so every approach to fusion differs massively um the way that you get your fusion to actually happen can go from something called a stellarator, which is essentially you have this machine, which is crazily, a crazy geometry. It's all 3D, it's all twisted, but it can run continuously for years at a time, all the way up to laser fusion, which is right at the other end of the scale where you fire massive lasers at this thing and you explode a target and create fusion that way. And that happens maybe 60 or 70 or 100 times a second. Um, so you've got these really long timescale things, these really short pulse things. Um, and obviously the technology you need to do that differs massively. Um, but in every single approach to fusion that you need to take, you will have to deal with high heat fluxes. You will have to deal with neutrons that will damage materials. You're going to have to deal with tritium and all of the infrastructure that goes around um, tritium. And you're going to have to deal with um, robotics. You're going to have to put all these things together in a way that doesn't require human intervention. Um, and there is a lot of things that are going on in tokamak fusion that aren't going on in these other sectors that can directly fit into that. So a lot of the innovation that's going on now in, in fusion in general and in magnetic confinement fusion in tokamaks can help feed these other sectors as well. And it might be, it might be that in 20 years time, some amazing innovation in lasers means that laser fusion is the way forwards. And we just have to hold our hands up then and we say, okay, if that's the path that leads us to fusion energy the first, then that's the right path to take. And a lot of what we're doing now will directly help that, right? A lot of it is transferable. Um, I think that's more probably my approach. The reason that um, tokamaks are the front runners is just because, is because they're the most mature technology. They're the essentially the best balance between easiness of getting running and um, actual fusion that they can produce. And JET is holding the fusion record by a huge, huge amount. It got 65% of the power out that it put in back in the 1990s, and it's gonna do the same uh, probably in 2021. Um, nowhere else has got even remotely close to that. Um, so that, so Tokamaks are the front runner, 
but a lot of the development that goes into Tokamak sort of directly feed on into this whole blanket of fusion ideas that are bubbling away. And the more, the better. Thanks. Right. So um, we, we've gone on quite a, quite a long way past. So I'll, I'll just give you one more one more question, okay, um, uh, Nick, and then and then we'll close up. Uh, so this one: um, How small could a fusion reactor be, and could Ooh. could we put them on spaceships? Oh, that's a great question. I cannot I cannot say for certain how small a fusion reactor could be, but what I can. Um, first off, whoever asked that, um, I wonder if you've watched Interstellar. A little little trivia fact for you. If you look on the Interstellar wiki for the film Interstellar, you'll discover that all of the spaceships in Interstellar were actually designed with small spherical tokamaks as their fuel supplies. Right. So that, that's pretty cool. Um, how small could you make one? Oh, that's tough. So the first, the first spherical tokamak fusion reactor will not be that small. It'll probably be about the same size as jet. Um, so that's pretty big. That's about four... Eight, eight meters across so it's pretty pretty large um, and a lot of that is driven by things like you have to make sure that all the magnets around your machine so the magnets affect the plasma but they also affect one another and they push apart or they pull together you've got to make sure that they are sufficiently spaced apart that they don't just pull each other together and break um, you have to make sure that the heat that you produce is um, tolerable and the smaller it gets the worse that gets and you have to make sure that the amount of neutrons you produce actually produces energy and that you get more neutrons the bigger the machine um could it be put on a spaceship well that's an interesting question um probably not in the current designs that we have if you want to produce net electricity but a smaller machine could be used to produce a net source of neutrons which has all sorts of other uses that you could imagine um, yeah, I think that's probably my my best answer for this. So, not a, a current design miniaturization is not really um, a key player. But I think once we get to linking to the grid, once we get to the point where we've got a design in place, then miniaturization starts to become uh, much more of a much more of a thought piece. Um, so, I, I think I think James, I need to uh, end it there because I can hear my um, dinner being created for me in the background. Um, right. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. I really, really appreciate, that, especially that there are still so many people tuned in, and that you've come on um, your uh, busy evenings, uh, busily self-isolating, to come and uh, watch me give this talk. I, I believe that the well, the, the talk has been recorded. I've recorded the talk in the question and answer session. And I believe that it will be um, available for distribution if you want to uh, see it some other time. And if you want to make contact with me, please feel free. Um, my details were at the end of the talk. Or, and, and if you'd like a copy of the talk, please get in contact with me. I'm more than happy to share the slides. Come down when you're free to walk around again. Come and see what we do down at Cullum, down at UKEA. We give um, regular tours, regular open evenings. It's really exciting. And keep watching out for us. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Nick. Thank you, James. Take care. Bye. <clears throat>